All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started at this point. Um, again, uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us today uh, on this webinar on how to master CMS program audit preparation. Um, the presentation is going to run about 40 to 45 minutes, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll try to get some time at the end for um, additional questions. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping, though, first. Uh, we will be putting all attendees on mute throughout the presentation, so if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat or in the QA box option of the Zoom meeting. This is usually located on the bottom right, <coughs> excuse me, uh, part of the screen, or you can typically access the chat by pressing Alt and H. Um, if you'd rather send your questions uh, via email, uh, please send the, your email to info at innovare.com. That's I-N-F-O at Innovare, I-N-O-V-A-A-R-E.com. Um, if you have questions for us today and we don't have time to answer during the webinar, we will be responding to every question via email as soon as possible. In addition, uh, this presentation will be recorded and along with the Q&A summary um, will be available on our website at www.innovare.com. Now with all that fun stuff out of the way, um, let me go ahead and introduce our, today's panelists. Um, with me today, I have our Director of Compliance, Ms. Judy Mason. Uh, Judy is our resident expert on regulations and audit processes and has been in the industry for over 15 years. Unfortunately, our Chief Compliance Officer, Brenda Wade, will not be able to present today. Uh, Brenda and her family are affected with the severe weather in Houston and is without electricity or heat today, and therefore will not be able to be a panelist uh, with us today. Um, we wish her and everybody affected with the severe weather conditions well and, uh, and got to be with them. <coughs> with that, Judy. Anyway, we, uh, we just uh, went through the Super Bowl just a few days ago. Uh, ironically, it, it brought to memory a, a, a commercial that came on a couple years ago from EDS. Uh, it reminded me of how uh, you can feel when you're going through a CMS uh, audit. Uh, so why don't we take a quick moment as Judy gets ready and um, play this video for you. This man right here is my great grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs, well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at his face, it's it just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, you, you hear the stories, it's, I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. EDS, managing the complexities of the digital economy. This man right here is my great... Sorry, but just one moment, please. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty with Judy's mic at the moment. Give me one second, please. All right, well, Judy's going to have to rejoin the meeting. So while she's doing that, let me go ahead and go over today's topic. Um, today, we're gonna to be discussing the 2021 program audit process overview. We're gonna be going into the, you know, the preparation before an audit, uh, then the, uh, the four phases of an audit, uh, such as the audit engagement and universe submission, the audit field work, the audit reporting, and finally, the or uh, the audit validation and closeout, and then additionally, uh, we want to consider what, what do you have to do after the audit, because we all know the audit just doesn't end at that point. 
Um, one of the things, uh, as we're talking about this, uh, it brings me to um, to recall is I remember way back in the day when we had to uh, prepare binders for CMS. Um, I don't know if any of you remember that aspect of, of life. Um, I remember having to have my uh, team literally spend the night with me as we were getting ready to uh, submit our, our uh, CMS um, uh, folders for their on-site visit. Um, we really, it took us uh, about 4.45 in the morning uh, getting ready for the audit. Um, we just had enough time to, uh, you know, leave, get home, shower, shave, grab something to eat and get back for our eight o'clock call. So uh, definitely an experience I, <laughs> from that point on, tried to avoid. Um, and I guess uh, I, I believe uh, some of you have had that uh, similar situation to uh, come across. Um, it's never fun to be under that kind of pressure to get things uh, submitted, submitted correctly, um, validated uh, before you start your audit. All right, great. Thank you. Um, sorry about that, everybody. My apologies for the delay, but um, let's go ahead and carry on. Um, first thing we wanted to go over is the HPMS memo that was um, issued on October 29th. Um, it, get, it informed us at that time. So, well, previous to that time, we had Everybody's been a little concerned that we're going to have to use the new 2021 protocols. And they gave us a slight release saying, no, now we're going to use the 2020 audit protocols for program audits and timeliness monitoring projects during 2021. Um, the, and then there's audit process updates um, also included in the memo. Um, such as the overview document for 2021. Um, everybody should be reading that. Uh, that it informed us that engagement notices are expected between March and July. Uh, it removed language uh, describing CMS's process for quantifying drug and or enrollee impact because it wasn't considered comprehensive and they didn't feel it applied equally to all audited program areas. And then uh, also let us know that the CPE portion that is historically held on site could be a webinar this year. Also, uh, typically most of us are familiar with the standard audit cycle CMS has followed. Um, the audit cycle typically was what, once every three to five years, um, occasionally two years. Mm -hmm. Um, so if, if uh, I was recently audited, I can, you know, take a breath of relief for, for a moment. Um, however, uh, we've heard from, the, from CMS um, that CMS is starting uh, fresh and that past or previously audited plans are not out of the woods at this time. Um, any plan that have or may have had uh, recently been audited may still be visited by CMS. If there may be any known performance issues that are currently going on, if their CTM complaint volume is high or if there's been a congressional congressional um, complaint submitted for that plan. So again, uh, if something causes them to, they're, they're more than willing at this point to uh, go back and audit, even if they just finished an audit in the past year or so. There's some things to ensure before an audit because audits aren't something you can cram for at the last minute and expect a good outcome. Um, and just always keep in mind that the goal isn't to be perfect, but CMS does these assessments because they want to see that compliance is happening every single day at your plan. Um, we need to evaluate some deliverables that, uh, such as, uh, have you done a risk assessment? Have you conducted your FWA and code of conduct trainings? Have your PMPs been reviewed and ensured that they're in line with current um, CMS guidance? SNP mock changes and trainings. There were AIP letters that needed to be implemented. Are they being used? Uh, an update to the notice of denial of medical prescription drug coverage. And then also looking at your FDR relationships um, and looking at, are you getting regular records from them? Do you need to make any contract 
update. Uh, looking at your delegation oversight and if there's any new relationships you should review to confirm that they're adhering to the requirements. Oh, yeah, true. Thinking about FDRs brings back that uh, video of the cat herding. <laughs> but seriously, <Yeah. laughs> you, need to, you, you need to take the take the lead on that. You need to uh, remind or reiterate to them that they are obligated to support CMS requirements as an FDR, and they should be making those routine reports to you. Um, <clears throat> in addition, uh, as, as a plan, you, you should be uh, sharing the HPMS memos that are relevant to them. Um, again, they the the FDRs don't always have access or don't always get those uh, timely. So again, making sure that they have the ones that they need to be uh, affected with um, uh, is always a, a good practice. Um, <clears throat> we also talk about an audit playbook. Um, so what is an audit uh, playbook? Um, you know, your playbook is supposed to be a comprehensive rundown of how every activity maps to your internal policies and the operation and the uh, appropriate compliance regulations. Um, <coughs> when you've gone through all the steps of your risk assessment, et cetera, uh, you know, again, enhanced visibility into the compliance process and your ability to analyze and manage transactions at a detailed level, you can begin to create your actual audit playbook. The roadmap allows auditors to understand exactly how any automated process functions and how your decisions are being made for these cases. The playbook should include all the methodologies related to pulling data into the reports that, re that the auditor requires. <coughs> I apologize. Um, it should include your current administrative policies and procedures related to the decisions that are being made. Again, if you have all that in place up front, it makes the job a lot easier to make sure that the regulators and yourselves are looking at the right data at the right time to make sure that you're staying in compliance. Something that may be surprisingly difficult to get right in some situations, especially when it's time sensitive. Uh, <coughs> hmm, my apologies, now it's my turn to cause a delay. Sorry about that. Um, the ability to, to trace every data element through every touch point is essential for demonstrating that your comprehensive playbook is, is working and that the, the pathway policies and decision trees can be eliminated, can eliminate confusion. <coughs> Go ahead, Judy. Oh, <laughs> okay, um, mock audit. Let's go on to mock audit. This is where if you have an audit playbook, you get to exercise it. And it, if you regularly schedule them, you'll get continual visibility into your admin processes, member relations, and clinical decisions. Um, if you can simplify it with data management tools and reports, they're developed to reduce extensive manual in involvement, then you could um, conduct these without committing too many additional hours. And then the health plan can reduce the burden while maintaining readiness for a real CMS audit. Now, audit engagement is the time to call out your internal and external troops. And this is where your practice pays off. If you've been practicing ahead of time, they'll be much quicker at being aware of what needs to happen. And this is also, at this time, you would have to disclose any issues of noncompliance. And that has to be done within five business days of the engagement letter. Now, these issues of noncompliance are ones that have already been reported to CMS before you got the audit engagement letter and are put onto a pre-audit issue summary template that's in HPMS, or it would be then um, you'll move into as well your universe submission. You need to notify your FDI um, of the audit review period so that they can provide their um, universe submission. And if you've been creating and reviewing universes routinely, you're ahead of the game. Uh, uh, it, it, depending on your audit, review time frame of one, two, or three months based on the plan size. You, uh, I think everybody's aware that you have three attempts to get it right. 
And the other thing is, is that during these 15 days, um, while you're getting those together, you can also be using that time to prepare for your webinars and uh, maybe do some practice work. Um, and then CMS will, once those are turned in, CMS conducts their integrity testing and makes their sample selections for uh, the next phase. Uh, an audit field work schedule will be provided to the plan with the webinar session scheduled each day. Uh, that way you can ensure appropriate staff is available. Keep in mind also that some webinars will run concurrently. So you carefully consider your staff for each one of those. Um, these are webinars are typically conducted during normal business hours but they could also request alternative hours. Uh, you would also notify your delegates of cases involving them since they're going to have to uh, attend the webinar as well. It would be a good idea to get someone um, assigned to housekeeping for things such as setting up the webinars, conference room arrangements, people who would be attending each one and that, that sort of thing. Yeah. So with, with all that said, why don't we take a quick moment, if everybody's willing to, um, and use our chat feature to take a quick poll from our attendees. So the, the, the question I want to propose is, what is your greatest concern during this phase of an audit? So during the audit engagement in the universe submission, what are your uh, biggest fears or what are your biggest uh, uh, complexities for that? Um, if you go ahead and put that, uh, send us a chat, uh, we'll kind of uh, circle back to that in just a little bit um, to try to you know uh, go over what folks are saying. Okay. Um, all right, well, we'll go ahead and continue on here. You can all still put in your information. So um, we'll look at that in a little while. Um, when it comes to sample selection, CMS provides those one, about an hour before the webinar starts. Um, they'll hold an entrance conference on the first day of field work and the auditor in charge will review the schedule and expectations for the week. And then come the webinar reviews. And this is where you present your live source system information and supporting documentation. Uh, if any cases during that time could be deemed pended, supporting documentation may be uploaded um, for further consideration. Hey, Judy, while we're talking about webinar, let, let's take a quick moment uh, to talk about webinar etiquette. Um, we've we've heard some grumbling from a couple of the um, uh, CMS auditors or, or firms that have gone through this. Um, so just a few things to keep in mind when you're doing your webinar review. Um, you know, give yourself at least 15 minutes, and <laughs> apparently this wasn't an example of that for in this webinar, um, to make sure all the, <laughs> you, you test all your technologies, make sure your video is working, et, et cetera. So again, you know, try, try to get that uh, get that done as much as possible. But, you know, Murphy always takes a, takes a role when it comes to, to that uh, area. Um, remember, if you're on video, though, uh, make sure you use a virtual meeting dress code. Uh, nobody wants to be the uh, highlight uh, reel of, of something that gonna, it goes on uh, in the background or, or something that they're wearing. Um, you know, shove your clutter into your closet. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, mute or muffle uh, surrounding madness. Uh, make sure you have everyone on mute when they're not speaking. Background noises are disruptive, especially in today's environment where many staff members are working from home. If they can, get them to use headsets. That minimizes the background noise and, and keeps some of that other stuff, other clutter out of out of the the speakers. Um, you know, obviously, ask people that have their housemates to uh, be quiet. Most importantly, you know, <laughs> mute your phone when you're not speaking. <clears throat> but when it is your turn to speak, <laughs> announce yourself and what department you're you're um, you're coming from. Remember, the auditors don't know everybody that's on staff at the health plan. Um, therefore, when someone is answering a question, make sure that they state their name and what department they're representing. Again, it, it's validation for the auditor of who's speaking and what's their, their role in the organization. <clears throat> uh, lastly, 
uh, and I know this is a, a struggle for me, but try not to multitask. Uh, it's, it's very easy during webinars or, or web meetings to uh, do something else while things are going on. Um, give your colleagues or your, uh, their undivided attention. Um, you know, a good rule of thumb is that if the behavior would raise eyebrows in an office, then you probably be, shouldn't be doing it in a virtual meeting setting. Online meetings permit a little more leniency, dress code, and other things. But again, at the end of the day, it is a, a professional um, business activity that's going on. Right. And um, during a webinar, you also have the ability to place the call on mute if it's necessary in, in order to have like a sidebar, but try to use these sparingly. You'll CMS will do the same thing to you. They'll put you on mute and talk amongst themselves. You have the opportunity as well practice how this should be done and when what what's the signal for um when you want to put it on mute and um because if you find yourself a little stuck and you need to confirm some information you can do it just be careful not to overdo it um and then Let's see, let me look at my note. Steepy. Okay. Right, and then um, your CP audit, CPE audit may be uh, on site or by webinar, as we mentioned earlier. And then um, we're gonna get a little bit further into the dreaded tracer reviews. Now, these are conducted during the CPE audit and tend to make people uneasy. Tracer sample selections are provided to you about two weeks prior to the CPE entrance conference. And uh, for SNP mock, they give them to you on the Thursday before the entrance conference. Now, um, one best practice we've seen put in place is to complete a tracer review for each audit and monitoring that's conducted. And it seems like extra work, but keep in mind, it can be sim simpler to do that when the particulars of an audit or a monitoring are fresh, as opposed to going back possibly months later and scrambling to put this together. This, um, uh, the uh, questions that were um, being displayed uh, that provides you the 10 basic topics that you can answer as many as possible. Can you go back to that, the question? Oops, sorry. Oh, no. Yeah, go on. Yeah, that one right there. Sorry. <laughs> um, but try to answer as many of these as possible. You, you can see these, you get the idea of the types of things you want to try and include in a tracer summary. And you also keep in mind that you could be asked to do a tracer for an HPMS memo. So on your HPMS memo is always keep good, clear information about how you communicated the uh, memo to your organization, what the responses were and any documentation to support um, how you're compliant. Okay, go ahead and go to the next next one. So once the audit field work phase is concluded, the auditor in charge will pro provide a preliminary um, draft audit report. And this will contain conditions, observations found during the audit. And it's provided at least one hour before the exit conference. And then the exit conference itself could be on site if they've done their CPE audit on site, um, or it could be by webinar. The report is presented to the plan. The plan has the opportunity to ask about findings and give follow-up information. And this is the time to make a formal response or provide comment for CMS consideration during the draft audit report process coming up. Okay, 
And then um, condition classification, you work on these before you actually get the formal notification because you have a good idea at this point what they are. So don't wait for them to tell you, you can begin working on it uh, much sooner. Now, ICAR condition notification, they provide that to you within 10 days of the exit conference. You have three business days to respond and validation of that response will begin immediately to confirm that it's been resolved. And these count as two points in the audit scoring methodology. The draft audit report um, comes in an Excel spreadsheet and uh, the plan has to respond to that within 10 business days by uh, adding a new column to the draft audit report and uh, adding a column at the end of it and, and putting their comments in there. And then um, the final audit report, uh, plans have to respond to a car within seven days of receipt. And these, these corrections can wait until the final audit report has been issued. So you were, you were um, encouraged to consider some of the things before you get the audit report, but these are items that you'll have a little more time with so you can focus on the um, more urgent uh, conditions and ICARs and so forth. Okay. And then the last phase of a uh, program audit uh, involves uh, your CAP submission. And this will likely uh, experience some back and forth until CMS accepts your CAPs. Your wording in, in your CAP submission should represent only what's indicated in the um, corrective action request so that you avoid accidentally expanding the scope of uh, the issue. And uh, it includes, uh, or you should include your implementation timeframe and then document the effectiveness of uh, the CAP by providing measures, methodology, and results. How is ineffectiveness identified and resolved? You provide your root cause, your beneficiary impact, and you can use universes to your benefit to review and look for positive trends. Um, you should set up electronic folders right away for each car to assist with validation and put in there your policies and procedures, any reports, trainings that were conducted, sign-in sheets, um, audit and monitoring results, communications, et cetera. Um, keep check again on, on have, making sure you don't have scope creep. And then um, audit validation, uh, Again, that's something you should begin planning at the time of the engagement notice. Uh, keep in mind that while an audit validation has uh, 180 calendar days uh, of the CAP acceptance, uh, extensions may be requested in certain circumstances, uh, such as if part of what you're going to do is implement a new system and that going to run you longer than, a, you know, the 180 days. So um, extensions aren't out of the question. Um, uh, you should create ongoing oversight activities for each condition to make sure that what you're doing is effective and that it stays effective. Um, and any new conditions discovered during validation audits have to be reported to CMS. Then uh, there's a closeout by CMS and it's time for the plan to consider lessons learned. 
So we all know that a, a you know the a, a program audit never really actually ends, right? Um, because even after the audit, you have all the activities that need to happen. You you need to make sure that um, you know. Uh, <clears throat> that if every, even if everything went well, you have a few observations, you know, maybe a car that you're responding to, and hopefully no I cars, of course. Um, but again, uh, the the activities still happen, um, <clears throat> so it really actually never ends. And in order to keep compliant, you continually have to keep the process going. You need to be diligent in regularly creating your universes, review the universes for outliers. This call this can also be folded into your continuous monitoring program. So think about it, uh, when, you, when you have your delegates or when your departments submit their universes to you and you review them just the way that CMS does, I mean, that is the, exactly the way that they're monitoring you. So why not use that, that method to monitor your own groups so that you can consistently be, be there with that? Um, continue monitoring to assist and identify trends and tracking process improvements. You know, util, utilize for routine metrics as needed or short-term reporting during post audits, process and remediations. Again, uh, keeping track and trending all the different things that have happened and how long ago it, it, it's happened. Um, you know, in essence, at the end of the day, um, you've got three options. Now, before I go into each of those options, each of those options, I wanted to circle back real quick on our, our poll. So thank you for everybody that responded or submitted their poll request or poll answer. Um, the top two that seem to pop up um, is first universe creation with so many uh, entities, you know, timeliness, uh, you, you don't have a lot of time to provide them. And then the accuracy, uh, you know, uh, making sure that they're accurate or folks that may or may not take their uh, uh, reporting as seriously as it needs to be um, was one of the comments that was, was brought on. Um, the other, mm -hmm. the second major, I'm sorry, the, the second major one that was brought up was the complexity due to the remote. So, you're not all in a room with your webinar and CMS at this point. So how do you get that? How do you achieve that cohesiveness between your group when you're in different parts or, or, or throughout that process? So again, um, you know, uh, so those are the, the, the two main things that, that came out from, from the poll. <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. I apologize for that today. Um, so again, uh, you know, the, the hope is that you can generate clean universes without relying on the traditional infrastructures. So again, is there a way to get this uh, more automated, uh, the process cleaner to, to get those universes created so that doesn't require such a, a manual uh, uplift, uplift to get that done? Um, and then can you create those universes on demand so that you can actually use them as your um, monitoring, uh, you know, review them on, on occasion. Again, the, the more you practice, the, the, the more you get these things done, mm -hmm. the easier it is going to be to, to uh, be compliant in the long run. One of the things that we have found with our clients is the clients that have a habit of requiring their FDRs and entities to submit their universes on a consistent basis. Um, it's painful at first. It's like when you teach a kid to tie their shoes, but over time they get better and better at submitting it. And it makes your job easier and easier to spend less time validating that it's correct um, and more time analyzing the information that's there to make sure you identify the true risks to the company. I hope that makes a little bit of sense mm -hmm. to everyone. Um, yeah. The vision, obviously, sorry, sorry, did you say something? No, I was just agreeing with you out loud. <laughs> ah. <laughs> right, thank you. Um, you know, the vision is view your plan like CMS does. Uh, ma make sure that you're taking into account the things that they're using. Uh, it's kind of like a you know uh, you know a teacher grading your papers. Uh, make sure that you're you know answering the way the teacher wants, right? Uh, to make sure that those things uh, uh, get the passing grade uh, from them. You know, and then detail how to improve your compliance program. So as you do your analysis, as you're going through this practice sessions um, with everything, you get better at identifying where the true issues are and what needs to be corrected. And you can get ahead of the game by getting those things in place. Now, how do you do all of this? It's, it's, it's you know, easy for me to say, right, from, a, from the other side of the phone in a webinar. Um, but again, uh, th there's three, three ways to do it. Obviously, you need to compile this information and get it uh, into, into a central location that you have it. So you pretty much have three options. You can build it yourself. Um, it's probably the least costly way of doing it. It's also the most time-consuming way of doing it. Um, you know, uh, trying to create right. your access sheets and all that. Uh, and Judy, you can kind of jump in on that uh, from your personal experience. Yeah, because I... 
Right. <laughs> my my health plan experience, I'm very well acquainted with the manual processes using spreadsheets, SharePoint, Access, Tableau. They were all nice, but I was always looking for something better. <laughs> Again, absolutely. Those are all great tools that uh, you have to physically uh, go through it and work with. Um, the other option is rent it. Uh, there are consulting firms or agencies out there that will come in and, and help um, with this, help you, uh, you know, help them, um, you know, work through um, mock audits, help you, help you do some of the, the lifting. Um, again, <coughs> that's probably the uh, most expensive way of doing it. Um, you know, is it efficient? Yes, absolutely. The, you, you, the expertise comes in to help out. Um, it does rely. It, it relies on external control, though. So again, you're you're relying on on the uh, on other folks uh, jumping in and doing those pieces for you. Um, but again, it, it really depends on your organization's preference of how they want to go about doing that. Um, but again, uh, you know, uh, practicing and getting that information into one central place and and doing that is is obviously uh, ways of doing it. The third one is there are some technologies out there that actually do some of this. Um, you know, one of the poll questions was creating the universes and making sure that they're okay. Um, I know of a couple different companies that provide uh, what we would call software scrubbing or software, uh, software, universe validation tools out there that'll take the universes, validate them uh, to the CMS guidelines. And then if they're any good, they'll actually start highlighting things that would be potential um, issues that CMS would focus in on. Um, <coughs> I won't say that's the cheapest way to go. It definitely usually is not. It's probably in the mid range. It's usually not as expensive as the consultants, not as cheap as trying to, you know, do the Excel and, and the manual labor in its place. Um, it is uh, pretty effective though. It, it saves a lot of time. Um, in essence, what, what, what it does when you have the technology involved, it helps you go through the high volume of, of, of cases that are in the universe and quickly identify which ones you need to focus on without having to, you know, sit there with a the ruler and go line by line and guess what's going on um, with that. So again, that, that, those are some of the, the, the ways that you can go through and, and adapt that. Um, the other one that was brought up is the complexity due to uh, remote access. You know, the only way around that is practice, to be honest. Um, you've got to, you, you have to uh, get your team, you know, used to, using that type of technology to report. Um, you know, ha have your team, uh, you know, have a webinar or have a, a, a Zoom call with you and have them present to you uh, a tracer or a case and, and get them used to, you know, having to quickly respond to questions that you're throwing them. You know, you know, uh, you know what, one of the things, and, 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 and I'll give you one of the tricks that we're, we try to use here with our webinar is we actually have a, a text chat open on our phone with each other um, while we're go doing our presentations. If I'm going too fast, Tom yells at me, slow down, Gabe, um, <laughs> or, uh, or things like that. So that's, a, that's another avenue that you can put into your arsenal to try to deal with those complexities, uh, you know, with the remote, um, with everybody being remote and not in the same room. Uh, obviously, if you can put them all in the same room, highly recommended. Um, there's one thing to be able to put one phone on mute and have a quick two second discussion versus, you know, try to answer something while reviewing texts on, on the phone. So again, those are just a, a couple simple suggestions that, that we have um, in regards to, to those elements. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank everybody for hanging in there with us throughout the thing. Uh, we do have a few, we, we are a little past time, but we do want to open the floor up a little bit uh, to see if anybody would like to submit a question or two um, that we can answer. Again, if uh, we do run out of, if we do run out of time or, or aren't able to get the the, man, the, the questions answered, um, if you go ahead and, and, you know, we'll leave the line open. You can you know, submit a chat or a request. Um, and then um, in addition, if you want to send an email to info at innovare.com, we will be uh, happy to respond to it all. And then we'll put all the questions that have been asked uh, and the poll responses as well uh, onto our website so that if you wanted to come back and get a, a, a second look at this presentation and see what the answers to all the questions were, um, we'll be able to do that as well. Yeah. Hey, Tom, Gabe. Uh, yes, oh, yeah, Gabe, this is Tom. Yeah, sorry, I didn't realize you called me. Uh, but to uh, let you know, there are a few questions and I wanted to see if we could address one one of the um, poll uh, questions that I thought was intriguing. Uh, so, start with that, that poll uh, question about 
you know, having a concern about, you know, we have, we have many delegates and in several internal business units uh, involved in the supplying portion of the universe, especially ODAG. Mm -hmm. uh, so getting quality universes completed 15 business days is a real challenge. Um, you know, the, right. the, what's the best approach to address that particular timeliness challenge? Right. It um, again, uh, it it depends on your approach. You know, with the the options or the the three three options that that are available. But if you're when you're at any rate, all of them take practice. Um, if you're doing it with your own um, uh, developed processes or systems then you're still going to have to put it into practice. If you're using a consultant, you're still going to want to have practice in order to utilize them. And if you have some technology that may help you with um, those reviews to cut down the time that it takes, then that's the other thing. You're looking for efficiency in the process and um, uh, if, if you can get, if you can develop a, a, an approach that has a, a good receipt time, review, and then response to the delegates, if they, if you need something more from them, if there's, is not coming back um, uh, acceptable. So um, yes, it, and, and granted, some people have a few delegates and some have hundreds. They could have hundreds of delegates. So um, it's, a, it's a matter of the scope of the audit and um, really practicing under any circumstance is, is key. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, um, Gabe. No, I'm okay. Okay, great. Right. Now, uh, the questions are coming in. We're getting quite, quite a few about will the uh, webinar be available? Uh, and yes, we, we will make this website, uh, this webinar available. It's recorded. We'll post on our website. I believe we'll be mailing out follow up to all attendees. So we'll make sure that everyone has a recording of this, of this webinar. Uh, technical difficulties uh, may or may not be included. We'll see if we can filter some of that out, but, <laughs> but uh, that, that will be happening. Uh, we do have uh, a the question about, right? The slide deck and the recording. Correct. Thanks, Dave. Would it be a good practice to add some of the identified ICARs to the risk assessment for ongoing monitoring? Absolutely. I mean, if it was something serious enough to, to generate an ICAR, um, you definitely would uh, probably benefit from putting it um, in the risk assessment. And um, you, you would want to monitor it either ongoing or you would want to monitor, monitor it for a specific period of time, like three or six months, just to make sure that it's remaining compliant, that it's remaining effective. Well, see, the other thing about adding it to the risk assessment, you know, it, it also highlights it to everybody. So everybody's going to be able to see what the actions mm -hmm. are needed to make sure that the efficiency is corrected. And again, you know, one of the things is to get buy-in from all the different areas, right? Nothing gets more of a buy-in than an ICAR, right? Um, you know, when, when CMS gets upset, uh, obviously that's when everybody actually starts doing what they were supposed to have done from the beginning. So again, that's a, another way to keep that uh, to the forefront so that folks don't forget that they can't, uh, you know, uh, oh, it's it, it's done with, I can go back to my old ways. No, you've got to continue the new process from that point onward. Great. Okay. Uh, now, I don't know if it's a Judy or Gabe question. Are, are there 2021 audit elements we can view? Is there any audit so elements they, I'm trying, they can show? Yeah, I, I guess that, that's a two-pronged answer just to make sure that we're covering what is being asked here. Um, the 2021 audit elements, if you're talking about the protocols themselves that are currently in a draft form, um, Tom, can you confirm that we have uh, some, some information on our website on those? Uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, can, can you repeat the information on what? I apologize. On the 2021 um, audit protocols, 
from the webinar we did previously. Oh yeah, we do. That is indeed available. Uh, we have that on our in our knowledge base. Um, we can give we can give um, the URL for that for interested uh, okay. parties. And we also have a LinkedIn page where we have that webinar posted, our, our CMS program audit uh, LinkedIn group that we created to help people with this whole process. Right. So in answer to this, why don't we go ahead um, and send that as our answers that are linked to the uh, pre previous webinar then? Right, okay. right. Okay. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah. let's see. Going through, Gabe's been answering a few questions on, on, in Online here. Trying to. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, Yay. So yeah, uh, yeah, I think that that's all the questions so far um, um, that, that have I been addressed. A, yeah, I see a question about the audit playbook. If we have an example that can be shared, um, typically, you know, these are, are created by the health plan. Um, and so we don't personally have an audit playbook. It probably would be a good idea to try and make a mock one for um, consideration, but we don't have one because uh, audit playbooks that we might have had experience with were on the uh, health plan side. And, you know, with it being proprietary information, we wouldn't have that. That's good but we will definitely look in. Right. Okay. But we'll, we'll see what we can do about developing something uh, more of a, I don't know, <laughs> I want to say almost a template. So, but we don't have anything this minute. Well, anyway, it, it is top of the hour, and um, I guess we should uh, let everybody get back to their uh, uh, their their uh, day jobs. Um, <coughs> well, thank you for taking the time with us, and thank you for being patient with us. I, I know we've gone uh, 15 over due to our technical difficulties, so I do apologize for that. Um, you know, <coughs> uh, I want to thank um, uh, Tom and everybody for getting this all put together. Uh, Judy, especially you, thank you for... Uh, all the time you spent uh, putting the presentation together and presenting today. Um, we'll go ahead and leave the meeting uh, uh, open uh, just for a little longer in case you wanted to put in an additional question or two. Um, if not, uh, please feel free to send your questions to info at innovare.com and we'll add that to the Q&A response that we'll send out to everybody. Um, and again, it, it'll all be posted on our website, uh, www.innovare.com. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, can't even spell my own company. Um, dot com. Um, and again, uh, thank you again and have a great day. And for everybody affected by the weather, uh, please be safe. Thank you.